Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm Chris DeMuth. I'm a fellow here at the Hudson Institute, and I will be moderating uh, this afternoon's session in which we will be um, uh, recognizing and uh, celebrating and discoursing upon Tevi Troy's new book, What Jefferson Read, Ike Watched, and Obama Tweeted, 200 Years of Popular Culture in the White House. With a title like that, you might expect that the book is a parade of fun and entertaining stories about uh, presidents' idiosyncratic tastes in reading, theater, music, sports, movies, TV. Or maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's a study of decline <laughs> from <coughs> Adams and Jefferson reading Cicero in Latin. Uh, and the current bestseller over from the UK, The Wealth of Nations, to President Obama tweeting about his favorite dessert uh, or newest pop song. Well, there's a little of both of that, both of those things, uh, in this wonderful book. Uh, but it is a very serious, uh, it is a very serious work. Our presidents uh, since Andrew Jackson have been popular figures. Their popularity has been the most important source of their political power. They're the only national popularly elected uh, uh, politician, official, uh, at any given time in America. And their relationship to popular culture has been deep, and it has changed in fundamental ways over the decades and centuries. And that, above all, is Tevi Troy's subject in this book. Tevi is a senior fellow here at the Hudson Institute. Uh, he is uh, familiar with presidents and the White House. Uh, during the administration of George W. Bush, he was successively Assistant Secretary of Labor for Policy, Deputy Cabinet Secretary at the White House and liaison to the Jewish community for the president. He was a senior member of the U.S. delegation to the Organization for Security and cooperation in Europe. He took a little time off to work on the Bush re-election campaign in 2004. And from 2007 to 2008, he was Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services. <coughs> uh, since uh, his uh, uh, tenure in the government, uh, he has uh, written one book uh, before this one, Intellectuals and the American Presidency, Philosophers, Jesters, or Technicians. He is uh, a prolific uh, author and may be said to be a full-spectrum public intellectual, uh, publishing in The New Republic, Reason, National Review, The Weekly Standard, National Affairs, City Journal, and Washingtonian Magazine, <clears throat> where he writes about the presidency, as you might expect, current issues in politics and policy, uh, and issues of uh, public health uh, reflecting uh, his involvement in those issues when he was at uh, HHS. We're going to begin with uh, uh, Tevi uh, telling us about his book, what motivated him to write it, and what he thinks the most important themes uh, from the book are. Uh, and I hope he won't tell you too much, because I expect everyone to go out and buy the book uh, afterwards. And we will then hear from a perfect group of panelists. These are people who do read Cicero and other books. They also write books, and they blog, podcast, Facebook, tweet, broadcast, and probably do some other things those of us in this room haven't even learned about yet. We will start with Jonah Goldberg, uh, who is editor-at-large of National Review Online, a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, and a regular contributor to uh, Fox News. Uh, uh, Jonah has been around the world of popular media and trying to elevate it and educate it for a long time, beginning in the 1990s as founding producer of the PBS Think Tank with Ben uh, Wattenberg. Uh, he has written two New York Times bestseller, including one that went all the way to the top of the chart, uh, Liberal Fascism. Uh, following Jonah, we will hear from uh, Bill Galston. Uh, Bill is Senior Fellow and Ezra Zilka uh, uh, Chair at the Brookings Institution. 
Uh, he taught uh, for many years in the government department at the University of Texas and in the public policy school at the University of Maryland. Uh, he also has spent time in the White House and on the hustings as Deputy Assistant uh, for Domestic Policy for President Bill Clinton uh, and work on the presidential campaigns of both Walter Mondale and Al Gore. Uh, his uh, field is uh, political uh, philosophy and political institutions. He's the author of eight books, the most recent, Public Matters, Politics, Policy, and Religion in the 21st Century, published in 2005. And then we will hear from Mona Charon, who is a nationally syndicated columnist, a, a journalist, and political uh, analyst. Uh, following the pattern here, she worked in the White House as a speechwriter for Nancy uh, Reagan during uh, Nancy Reagan's husband's administration. Uh, and uh, in a political campaign working for Jack Kemp in his presidential quest in 1988. Uh, her most recent book, and I want to mention that uh, Mona's most recent book is called Do-Gooders, How Liberals Hurt Th Those They Claim to Help, and Jonah's most recent book is How Liberals Cheat in the War of Ideas. But I want to make it clear uh, that Mona and uh, uh, Jonah exempt Bill Galston from all of their <laughs> animate versions <laughs> in those books, just to try to maintain a comity uh, among our panelists. But our subject today is not partisan. It is far more uh, elevated. Uh, we will begin with our author, Tevi Troy, and then proceed through uh, the three presentations. And then we'll have some discussion up here and open it up to everybody in the room. Thank you very much, Tevi. The podium is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chris, for that nice introduction. Thank you to my fellow co-panelists and to the Hudson Institute for sponsoring this event. The book, as Chris mentioned, is what Jefferson read, Ike watched, and Obama tweeted. And I mention it again because the tweet thing is important. Hudson Institute wants all of you to know that you may tweet this event at your pleasure, and so this is a tweet-happy event, and we will also take questions via Twitter. This is how even musty think tanks adapt to the 21st century. Getting to the title, I originally had a different title for the book, and I came up with the title after I saw an interesting incident that someone who, as Chris said, was a presidential historian and also someone who worked in the White House, an incident that kind of surprised me. A few years ago, President Obama was trying to sell his health care law. And in doing so, he went to the White House Correspondents' Dinner and he told a joke. The joke was about an exemption that he was trying to get for, uh, for, for the bill. And he said that we have got this tanning tax in the law. And in order to get this, thought, this law through, or the, the tanning tax through with the rest of the law, we're going to have to put forward an exemption for John Boehner, and for Snooky. Now, the crowd at the time laughed because at the time, Snooky was enjoying a cultural moment. I think now in 2013, her moment is unlamentably gone. But at the time, she was the foul-mouthed, buxom denizen of TV's Jersey Shore, in which she extolled the virtues of the, th the, the three number one priorities in life, GTL, Jim Tan Laundry. And it struck me how bizarre it was that the President of the United States was actually citing this person from the presidential podium. It also struck the President as somewhat bizarre, because the President was later asked about Snooki on The View, one of his favorite shows to go on, and he professed not to know who she was. And it led to this question appearing in my mind. Are we better off with a President who knows who Snooki is? or a president who doesn't know who Snooki is. And it's that tension in that question that really animates the book. And it led me to come up with my initial draft idea for a title, which was From Cicero to Snooki, How Our Culture Shapes Our Presidents. Now, the good folks at Regnery Publishing talked me out of that title, and I'll tell you why. They said that the Venn diagram of people who know Cicero and who know Snooki does not intersect. <laughs> And they were right about that. <laughs> but they were also right that three years later, Cicero is just as relevant as he has ever been, whereas Snooki is, as I said, unlamentably forgotten. So I went with this alternative title, which I think conveys what I'm trying to convey. My book is about 
the different eras in technology in delivery of culture and how they've affected the president. So when I begin with, with Jefferson Red, that's because at the time, those were the, uh, the available options to someone who was seeking either education or entertainment were the printed word or live entertainment. And so the first era I want to talk about briefly today is that period of the founders. Jefferson and Adams were probably the two best read people on the continent at, the t at their time, which is an astounding statement. You never think of the president of the United States being the, the best read person in the land. I'm not even sure we'd want the president to be the best read person in the land. But nevertheless, these people lived books. They consumed books. They were engaged by books. And this was at no small hardship to themselves. I say in the book, and Chris mentioned Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, in 1776, a first edition of that book in the colonies cost the equivalent in today's dollars of $615. That is the cost about of an iPad today. And if you were to have an iPad today, and if you have an iPad, I suspect many do, an iPad can store something like 160,000 to 180,000 books. And so when I report in the book that Jefferson had a library of over 6,000 books, that was no insignificant investment on his part. And I say investment because they not only had to spend a lot of money to read these books and to get these books, but they invested themselves in the books, and these books animated the discussions that led to the revolution from England, and, it, and the revolution is aptly named because it was indeed a revolutionary act. Breaking from England, breaking from a monarchy was something that had not d been done before. And these people, the founders, they found solace in the work of previous people who had gone before them, especially the Roman classics writers, people like Cicero, whom I mentioned in the title, who John Adams in particular w was taken with, and Cato, uh, um, Addison's Cato was a play that George Washington showed to the troops at Valley Forge in that very difficult winter to try and buck up their morale. So these people engaged with what had gone on with the Roman Republicans who were fighting against Julius Caesar and what they saw as the onslaught of tyranny. And so the founders found ideas from previous generations that helped enlighten them. And then I also mentioned enlighten. They also looked to the current writings in the Enlightenment to look for rationale for their break from England. And so you see the ideas of the Enlightenment in the Declaration of Independence, which Jefferson wrote. And then later, after they broke free from England, in the writing of the Constitution, James Madison, another founder and, and our fourth president, reached out to Jefferson, who was living in France at the time, and asked him for advice on what books to read as he was thinking about this constitutional project. And Jefferson, remember how expensive books were at the time, sent him two cratefuls of books. And these books were about law and philosophy and history, all of the subjects that Jefferson read so much and, and mastered. And Madison took those books, and he read those books, and he wrote a memo to himself about those books, and he used that memo to inform his thinking on the Constitutional Convention, the Constitution writing itself, and then the writing of the Federalist Papers to defend that great endeavor. And so the founders, not wrongly, had this vision based on having dealt with a very literate populace. The, the population of the colonies was much, had a much higher literacy rate than in Europe. And they obviously engaged in ideas. And so the founder's vision was of enlightened leaders presiding over an educated populace. That was the vision. Now, over the next two centuries, we would see that that vision was challenged. And it was challenged in two ways. The first way is in the second era I want to talk about, in the 19th century. In the 19th century, I said there were two types of entertainment available at the time. The other type was live entertainment. And if a president wanted to get his message out, if he wanted to go and see and be seen, he couldn't go on YouTube, he couldn't tweet something, he couldn't go on the radio or TV. He went to where the people were, and the people were at live performances. And so I tell the story of James Monroe going around the country on a goodwill tour, and in each city he would go to, he would go to theatrical performances because that's where the people were. But theater is a very democratic, small-d medium. In the theater people on the stage can react to the audience. When there's a film, when there's something on TV, that is static. That does not change based on who's seeing it or how they're seeing it. But the actors on stage 
in live performances can react to the audience, can interact with the audience, can recognize who is in the house that night and who is not in the house. And so I tell a story from 1824. There was a hotly contested election between John Quincy Adams, who I think was probably the best prepared person ever to be president based on his knowledge, his reading, his education, his previous experience in government. And he was up against Andrew Jackson, who was not nearly as well read. In fact, he ra rarely cracked a book. And he wasn't even much of a speller, as people used to point out at the time. So they have this presidential race, and Jackson wins a plurality of the popular vote, and he wins a plurality of the electoral votes. But he does not win the election, because Henry Clay throws his support to Quincy Adams. Clay is named Secretary of State, and this is what became known at the time as the corrupt bargain, and it was immediately unpopular. And so not long after this happens, John Quincy Adams, who was a theater buff, goes to the theater in Washington one night. And the actors, as I said, can react to what's going on in the House. They saw that the president-elect is in the House, and their reaction is to ad-lib references to General Jackson. And then the audience, seeing these ad-libs, they applaud lustily at every mention of General Jackson. And John Quincy Adams was so upset that, he, although he'd been a theater buff before, he significantly curtailed his theater going after that incident. And so the founder's vision came up against the raucous, raucous and sometimes bawdy and loud vision of these democratic theatrical venues. The democracy they found was much more open-ended, much more rabble-like than had been thought. And a man like Andrew Jackson, who ended up winning the 1828 election and unseated Quincy Adams, recognized the appeal to the common man. How do we know this? I tell a story in my book about Andrew Jackson going to Harvard to get an honorary degree. This made Quincy Adams apoplectic, that this person who he thought was an unlettered barbarian was getting a degree from his alma mater. But nevertheless, Jackson goes and he gets the degree, and he's expected to speak back to the students in Latin, which was the vernacular at Harvard at the time. And Jackson, seizing the moment, says, the only Latin I know is e pluribus unum. And that showed that he had this common touch, this ability to reach out to the common man, and that he wasn't going to be seen as one of these hoity-toity Harvard types, but that he was a man of the people. And what we learned in the 19th century is that if you, you might be educated in a certain way to govern, like a Quincy Adams, but you needed to have ju some General Jackson in, in order to get elected and get control. And the person who I write in the book had the best understanding of these two countervailing tensions was Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln grew up in poverty and obscurity, and he read a great deal in his youth, often to the disgust of his father, who tried to discourage him from reading all the time. But Lincoln read, and he read every book he could get his hand on. And I'm sure all of you heard stories of Lincoln traveling many miles through the snow to find a certain book or to borrow a book from a farmer. And he didn't have the same kind of book selection that, that we might have today. It was, it was very limited. And in fact, there were certain books that he read over and over and over again. And those included the Bible, Shakespeare, Aesop's Fables, Parson Weems' Life of Washington, and A History of the United States. And he internalized those books. And later, when he was a politician and he was running for office, he didn't cite books all the time but he had internalized those books and expressed their vision in the way he communicated with people. So he learned a certain type of common language from the Bible. He learned elevated speech from Shakespeare. He learned to use stories from Aesop's fables. And he learned a certain type of innate patriotism from the books on Washington and on the United States. And he used those successfully in his campaign for president in 1860, and then again in 1864. But Lincoln also was a man who loved the theater, especially once he became president. And I write in the book about how he liked to attend theater so often that John Wilkes Booth planned to assassinate Lincoln on the way to a different theatrical performance. And Lincoln actually decided not to go that night. The, the show is at the Old Soldier's Home. And Wilkes Booth changed his mind and then went and eventually did assassinate him at Ford's Theater at the showing of My American Cousin. And 
Wilkes Booth actually used his knowledge of the theater to figure out how to navigate his way through the house and even timed his shot to a, a well-known laugh line in the play. So in some ways, Lincoln uh, went to the theater and the theater expressed his democratic impulses, but in some ways he was undone by theater. And in fact, I tell the story in the book that his son was at a different show that very night. He was seeing Aladdin at a play a few blocks away, and he heard someone come in and say they have shot the president, and he went back to the White House and didn't find out till the next morning what had happened to his father. Well, after the 19th century, we had the second thing develop that challenged this founder's vision of the enlightened leaders and the educated populace, and that came about in the form of new technologies in the 20th century. First, we encountered broadcast and the ability to project your voice to many thousands of people beyond the people who are in the room in front of you. So for today, we're speaking to this audience, but there, we also know that there is a wider audience with the cameras before us. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt recognized this. People often talk about his fireside chats and how revolutionary he was with the fireside chats, and he was. But even before he became president, in fact, he may have become president because of his recognition of the importance of radio. At the 1924 and 1928 Democratic conventions, he spoke at those conventions, recognizing there was an audience in front of him, but also recognizing that there was a broader radio audience that was hearing his message. And in some ways, that's how he introduced himself to the, to the nation. And so radio was a new tool and a new medium for presidents. And we also think about Roosevelt and the radio, and it seems from reading about it that, that Roosevelt must have been on the radio all the time. The truth is he carefully marshaled his resources in this regard. He only did fireside chats two or three times a year. He also was very careful about how he did them. He had a tooth that whistled, and he would put in a false tooth to prevent the whistling before he went out on the airwaves. And he also used a special paper that didn't rustle so that people would think he was speaking off the cuff and not hear the rustling of paper in front of him. So he was revolutionary in the use of this new technology. And one of the themes of the book is the way that presidents need to recognize new technologies and take advantage of them. And that leads us to the fourth era, the television era, the, te the era we've just left. But in this television era, the first president of the TV era was Eisenhower. And Eisenhower recognized in some ways that TV is a two-way medium, that you can watch TV and enjoy TV, but as president, you can also convey yourself on TV. And Eisenhower did watch a lot of TV. He loved Westerns. He used to watch, uh, he watched so much TV in the White House, including shows like I Love Lucy. He would sit with uh, Mamie and watch with a TV dinner in front of them. But he watched so much TV in the White House that the ushers at one point complained that the White House social schedule was determined by the TV schedule. Now, if you remember in these days, there was no DVR, there was no VCR, there was no Netflix. If you missed that episode of I Love Lucy, you were out of luck. And Ike didn't want to miss out. But he also recognized how important TV was as a communications tool. And people talk about Kennedy as the television revolutionary, and he was indeed skilled at the use of television. But Eisenhower was the first president to give a televised news conference. He used TV speeches very effectively, including his famous speech about the military-industrial complex, a phrase that still is with us today. And he was the first president to hire someone from the TV industry, the actor and director Robert Montgomery, to advise him on his TV performances. Obviously, after Eisenhower, we did have Kennedy come, who out-debated uh, out Nixon on TV in that 1960 debate, although not on the radio. And Kennedy recognized how important TV was to his campaign afterwards, after the election, seeing a, a TV one day and saying, we wouldn't have had a prayer without that gadget. So Kennedy recognized how important TV was, but he really stood on the shoulder of a giant in terms of Eisenhower, who recognized the importance of TV even before he had. And so that was the, the TV era. And I said it's a two-way medium. The presidents not only saw TV, they not only appeared on TV, but they affected what was on TV. And one thing I, I, I cite in the book was this observation that presidents don't just watch TV, they are TV. And I tell this story about Bill Clinton during the Monica Lewinsky scandal. He goes away to get out of town, understandably, and he goes with Terry McAuliffe, who's now running for governor in Virginia, and Hillary Clinton. And on this vacation, such as it were, they are sitting there one night trying to watch television, and Hillary has the remote control. And she's flipping through channels. And she's trying to find a channel that does not include the Lewinsky scandal. It doesn't have a mention of it. And she's clicking, and she's clicking, and she can't find a channel. And she's getting increasingly frustrated. 
And you can imagine how frustrated, fr frustrating this was. And finally, finally, she comes to ESPN. Now, Hillary was not an ESPN fan, is not an ESPN fan. But on that day, she settled for some sports programming. On that very same vacation, McAuliffe notes that there was one point where the White House ushers came up to them and said, would anyone like a bottle of, would anybody like some wine? And Hillary said no. And Bill said no. And Terry McAuliffe said, I'll take the bottle, please. <laughs> you can't blame him. And so following this era of TV, which people like Bill Clinton were, were very skilled at despite the, this one episode, uh, we have a new era that we're coming into right now. And it may even be too early to name this era. But let's call it for now the internet era or the social media era. It's the era of disaggregation or of segmentation. When I was growing up in the 70s, you knew that if something was on All in the Family or Happy Days, everybody saw that. These shows were so widely watched by, by great swaths of audience members. People, people watched the show, and that's how you could appeal to a whole country, by, appe by appearing on one of these shows or by getting a message out on one of these shows. In today's day, even the most successful shows, even a show like Breaking Bad, which Jonah has this great piece in National Review on the cover, even a, a successful episode of Breaking Bad is seen by a tiny minority of the public, and even a show that gets as much buzz as Breaking Bad is never seen by a majority of the American population. And so in this era of segmentation, presidents must adjust. And I argue that President Obama has been revolutionary in his use of social media, in his appearance on different shows, to appeal to his audience, to segment the audience, as it were, to find places where he can get his message out to people who are likely to support him and to vote for him. And so he goes on shows like The View, and he has a Twitter account that has 30 million followers. And when he tweets something directly from him, it has the letters B-O at the end, so that you know that it came from President Obama. And this era is a, a different era, and it presents a new challenge. And you wonder in this era, if President Obama, who is so successful at winning two elections by this pop culture strategy, and he deserves credit, and I give him credit in the book for doing this, you wonder if it comes at a cost. And the cost can come in two ways. One is to him himself. He gave a remarks on Syria last week, and the response was not overwhelming. And you have to wonder if his super saturation of appearances in pop culture venues in the campaign last year may have colored people's judgments of him now, and they say, oh, well, I saw that guy in The View. Do I really want to hear him talk about Syria? And then, similarly, you wonder about the cost to the presidency. Does the stature of the office diminish when you have these kinds of appearances? Remember, President Obama is the first president to appear on a late-night talk show as president. You've had other people who appeared beforehand, obviously Clinton with Arsenio Hall. Nixon did his famous laugh-in appearance, which was only, he was only on screen long enough to say the word, suck it to me. But Obama regularly goes on late night talk shows. And so you wonder, is there a cost to the stature of the presidency for this? And so to summarize, I'll just mention the conclusions that I draw from this. Because people often ask, so you've written all this stuff about, and you've got all these great stories, what does it all mean? And I'll say that we can learn four things from this. One, there's an economic impact to what presidents watch or read. Uh, there, the Washington Post has chronicled this phenomenon called the presidential book bump. When President Obama is seen to be reading a book, that book sp spike, sales spike. And we've seen this a couple of times uh, in the past, be even before President Obama. In the 1980s, President Reagan at one point was reading an obscure insurance salesman named Tom Clancy. And he mentioned the book The Hunt for Red October, and Clancy s suddenly no longer had to sell insurance, but has been a best-selling author ever since. Then you have the policy impact. Sometimes I tell stories in the book about how presidents have read something or seen something that has shaped their policies. One of the most famous instances of this is when, uh, when you had uh, John F. Kennedy in 1963 was supposed to have read this book, The Other America, by Michael Harrington, which talked about poverty, and that led to the war on poverty. Now, as I write in the book, it's likely that he never read that book in, pr in particular, but he probably did read a book review in The New Yorker by Dwight, M Dwight McDonald, which is one of the most famous book reviews that The New Yorker has ever had. And so, in that way, what's out there in the culture can influence the policy. The third thing is the presidents use pop culture to humanize themselves or to show a different side of themselves. I mentioned Nixon on Laugh-In. 
Think about Clinton going on Arsenio Hall with sunglasses and the saxophone to try and show a different side of it. So you kind of can get a different type of appreciation of presidents and the way they appeal to people. But then the last is the way that presidents use pop culture to convey aspects of leadership. They can convey intellectualism by reading books. They can convey a larger-than-life image by talking about movies or, or appearing in movies. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was portrayed in more movies than any other president. And until Michael Bay's 2001 movie, Pearl Harbor, he was never shown on screen as in a wheelchair as president. 1960s Sunrise at Campobello has him in a wheelchair, but not when he's president. So he's never shown as president on screen. So the, it certainly showed an image of this great leader without recognizing his, his physical frailty. And then there's the common man approach. By watching TV, you can show a certain aspect of appealing to regular people. You watch this show on TV. You watch I Love Lucy. Well, Ike and Mamie watch it with the TV dinner in the, the White House. We're just like you. So that's another thing. And then the, the last aspect of leadership they can convey is, again, this notion of hipness, how you can show that you're kind of cutting edge and cool. And Obama has been a master of that. In, in fact, in terms of the shows he watches, I joke in the book that he likes the shows of the 1% rather than the 99%. He likes cutting edge, gritty, hyper-realistic shows on pay cable like The Wire or Board, Boardwalk Empire or Homeland. In fact, there was one incident where President Obama was briefed about a possible sleeper cell situation, and he said, oh, just like Homeland. And so we can learn a lot about presidents by seeing what they read, what they watch, what, uh, what they attend, and what they listen to. And I hope that all of you will appreciate what we say here about all of that, and I hope you come away informed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tevi. Jonah Goldberg, please. Uh, I, I want to say, first of all, thanks, for <clears throat> thanks to Tevi and thanks to the Hudson Institute for having me here. I'm a big fan of the Hudson Institute. In fact, the president of the Hudson Institute introduced me to my wife um, a while ago, although <laughs> the day after he introduced me to her, he said, uh, called me up to let me know that she was way out of my league and I shouldn't try. So. Um, <laughs> I appreciate it. it. gave me extra incentive. Um, so I, I'm going to try to be brief. I got a lot of thoughts about the book. Um, I really enjoyed the book. I think it's a wonderful book. Um, I think it's in many ways a lot like Tevi. It's very smart without being overly eggheady. Um, it's um, it has uh, it's full of stories and interesting trivia, a lot like Tevi. Um, and at the same time, it weaves them all together for a pretty grand theme. Um, I, I uh, <clears throat> one thing you might want to know, Toby, for the, your um, book tour, um, when you talk about uh, Andrew Jackson and others going to theaters to be amongst the people, um, there's an interesting counter trend going on right now. The, there's a big open primary for mayor of Minneapolis going on right now, and there's a guy running who has a viral ad campaign, and one of his chief promises is that if he is nominated and elected mayor, he promises he will no longer go to strip clubs. Um, so it kind of sometimes works the other way. Maybe we've come for a full circle. Um, I agree with Stanley Kurtz, who wrote a National Review Online, America's greatest website, uh, that in a lot of ways this book offers a certain kind of window onto America's soul, um, and maybe a little bit of Tevi's. But before I get into that, uh, I, I wanted to go a different route. Um, Tevi is a very old friend of mine. In fact, he's probably my oldest friend in Washington. I took his job at the American Enterprise Institute in 1991 or something. Um, and probably anybody who knows him knows, or me, knows that he's a much better Jew than I am. Um, but uh, I am actually a much better practitioner of the Seinfeldian faith of Festivus. And, and under Festivus, one has the airing of the grievances. And so I figured uh, I would go a slightly different way and grind some axes. Uh, Tevi's book is actually remarkably even-handed. It is not a partisan polemic by any stretch of the imagination. doesn't mean he doesn't have sharp ideas and sharp arguments to make, but they're not, um, uh, he's not exactly a hurricane of fists in the, in the fight between the various partisans on these kinds of things. Um, and I figured I would offer some sharper points. Um, starting with, I think Tevi is way too easy on the progressives. 
and way too easy on particularly uh, Woodrow Wilson. Now, some of you may know I am the treasurer of the International Association of the He-Man Woodrow Wilson Haters Society, <laughs> and so I am biased, but um, I'll start off by saying I did not know, as Tevi reports in the book, I didn't know that Wilson, in fact, probably did not say that Birth of a Nation um, was like history written with lightning. And uh, but next time I, I have a chance, I will correct my book on that. But um, he did let the endorsement stand for quite a while. And maybe one of the reasons why he did that, he was the most racist president of the 20th century, who resegregated Washington, D.C., um, and actually initiated the practice of um, you putting racial quotas into federal policy so as to keep whites out of the federal government. Um, he al I also thought, think it's sort of interesting um, to mention that the second Klan, the Klan of the 1920s, was in fact in many respects simply a movie cult um, in much the same way that uh, Star Wars dorks get dressed up as Darth Vader and all the rest. These guys were so uh, tr uh, in inspired by the movie that it actually became something of a cult because the Klan was in effect moribund. And Wilson's role in that, if it's even if it's less than I had thought, um, I still think is somewhat significant. I also you know, Tevi does this fantastic job of talking, as you heard some of it, of talking about the role of the classics and the ancients had on the Founding Fathers and on, on, on Abraham Lincoln and the interplay, the sort of intergenerational interplay of ideas going back from the beginning. And since Te Tevi's always had slightly Straussian tendencies, it's not surprising that he likes this idea of the idea that we've been looking through the wrong end of the telescope when we look back on the past. Um, I would have liked a little bit more about that sort of thing about the progressives. Uh, there's uh, much to my dismay in Tevi's book, and as well as the, the new biography of Woodrow Wilson by Scott Berg, there's no mention of Hegel. And Hegel was, um, first and foremost, a huge fanboy of Hegel. Um, he in, even invoked Hegel in a love letter to his wife. Um, he was such a fan. And uh, Tevi's got this great thing where he talks about how Wilson was such a devotee of, of detective novels, and how maybe uh, Wilson's obsession with detective novels betrayed a, a certain uh, frame of mind that thought you could solve the world's problems simply through pure reason alone, which was, in fact, um, a general intellectual malady and arrogance of, of most of the progressives. Um, and I would have liked to have seen a little bit more about the historicist school of Richard Ellie and the Wisconsin school and their relationship to things. You know, the New Republic was in effect, in effect founded as basically part of the Teddy Roosevelt cult. And there's a lot of great stuff about the cult of Teddy Roosevelt in there. Um, but as someone who also thinks that Herbert Crowley is one of the great monsters of the 20th century, um, I'm doing some of this just to sort of provoke Bill Galston. Um, uh, you know, it's funny, the, the New Republic was founded as this fan magazine of Teddy Roosevelt, but when the magazine actually ended up being very supportive of Woodrow Wilson, um, Teddy Roosevelt was really ticked off. And his response about it was, and I wrote, actually wrote it down because I thought it's one of the great cutting lines of American presidential rhetoric. He said that, that the New Republic had become a negligible sheet run by two anemic Gentiles and two uncircumcised Jews. Um, I don't know what that means, but I just think it's great. Um, but I mean, I, I could go on about this. I think one of the things yeah. that would have been great to have uh, is a little discussion of the movie Gabriel over the White House, mm. which was a movie that FDR was in fact a script doctor on. Um, and the whole theme of Gabriel over the White House, like a lot of these Prisoner of Zenda kind of movies, was that the president basically has this epiphany and decides to become a dictator and solves all of America's problems. And there's this great note from FDR to the studio saying, this will be of enormous help to me persuading people um, in my arguments, um, which I always thought was sort of amusing at the very least. Um, so, but now that I've gotten that out of my system, let me actually talk the book, about the book that Tevi wrote rather than the one I, w I wanted him to write. Um, it's actually a, an intensely subtle piece of work. And one of the things I love about it is that it sort of builds slowly from the s sort of glacial pace of the founding era, which was, you know, sort of where men's minds were lit by fire, but the actual movement of ideas had enough time to gestate to the sort of inverse which we have today where um, ideas can move at lightning speed but there's not much to them. And um, I think it's sort of interesting how it sort of tracks that. One of the, and that I think is one of the great lessons of the book and why I say it's partially a window on the soul of America, um, 
is that you know, there's this sort of Whiggish tendency that says every technological breakthrough makes the world and society better than prior to when we had it. And often that's true, Sci you know, in the realms of science and medicine and hygiene and all that. You know, I, I, I think we're much better off with modern dentistry, call me crazy. Um, but it's not necessarily true in the world of communications. Um, and this is one of these points I try to sort of impress upon young conservatives often, is that uh, conservatives are so obsessed with ideas and arguments and the founding and the, and the canon and all that, that we always want to have arguments with historical intellectual figures and intellectual movements. Um, and the problem is, is that technology actually has a more profound impact. The automobile, automobile did more to unsettle stable, intact communities than Nietzsche ever could. The problem is you can argue with Nietzsche, you can't argue with a Buick. And, um, and this is one of these things that I think comes across uh, so very well in the book. And I think that um, one of the questions I was left with when he talks about Teddy Roosevelt and his almost sort of ADD-like quality um, focused on being able to read and, you know, four or five books a night and all of that. Um, if we had someone like that today, would, would the Teddy Roosevelt of today, with, with that mental capacity and that sort of intensity, um, would he spend his time reading Cicero? Or would he spend his time mastering the next, uh, you know, edition of Grand Theft Auto or um, Call of Duty 5 or whatever it is? And I think that that's one of the things you need to think about in our society today is that technological change is siphoning off some of our greatest minds into essentially cul-de-sacs where they don't have the kind of opportunity for flowering that they may, have want, may once have had. Um, some people will say, you know, Tevi talks about how Jimmy Fallon introduced Barack Obama as the preezy of the United Steezy um, once and some people might say that that was like a huge boon or step forward for society and I'm open to the idea. I guess one way of making that argument would be that the barriers between the people and their elected representatives have been broken down thanks to modern technology. I'd be open to that. I just don't think it's true. I think that in many ways, because of the kind of manipulation that starts with JFK and, well, and FDR and, and, and follows through with Obama, of manipulating media elites into this cult of cool about the president, you actually have an even more imperial presidency than you might otherwise have had. Um, but people don't care as much because they think the guy in charge is cool or hip or whatever. Um, and so a lot of that just sort of seems to me like a rationalization. Um, and if you just sort of, I mean, I don't mean to seem like a fuddy-duddy, but if you just think about it this way, reading is superior to listening. That's not a, a cranky old man saying, you, get, you kids get off my lawn kind of thing. That is actually a scientific fact. You take in more information reading than you do listening. You take in more information listening than you do watching TV. Um, you take in more, um, you take on even less information on things like uh, Twitter. And I say this as someone with nearly 100,000 followers, I still don't get the point of Twitter. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things that sort of, what Tevi is so wonderful at in this book is he shows rather than tells. There's not a lot of exhortation. And this is one of the gifts that I think a lot of conservatives could pick up these days, is that we are too obsessed with exhortation and telling people things, and sometimes you have to show them. As Edmund Burke says, example is the school of mankind, and he will learn it no other. And so I think this is a wonderful book for, for partisans and nonpartisans alike, and I'm delighted to be here, and I expect Tevi to air his grievances shortly. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bill Galston, Bill Galston please. Whatever you'd like. Can you give me the high sign at 10 minutes? Well, uh, there we go. Uh, I appear on a lot of panels, and I've never been more out of my depth, indeed out of my league, uh, than on this one. I mean, I, you know, in the green room, I listened with a sinking heart, you know, as these allusions to popular culture whizzed by. I'm the, I'm the kind of fuddy-duddy Clintonian who memorized putting people first and who had to find out about the Arsenio Hall show the next morning in the Washington Post. I mean, that sort of <laughs> says it all. Uh, but, you know, you know, I 
Yeah, I actually come here neither to praise nor to bury the book, uh, but but rather to just share with you a few of the reflections that it evoked. And I thank Tevi and the book uh, for, having, for having done so. Uh, and I'm going to make these points quickly and in no compellingly uh, logical order. Uh, the, first, the first is a distinction that is woven through the book, particularly the first half, but which I think is not stated explicitly, and that is, the important difference between the things that form presidents and, you know, and the media through which they share some or all of that with, uh, with a democratic public. And so when we, you know, when we read about Jefferson and Adams and everything they read, uh, we're not talking about the sort of thing that they will use for democratic political purposes, uh, at least not, not, in any, not in any very direct way. They don't make, they don't make a show of it. Uh, and so I think, that, I think that this distinction between what forms public figure, figures and the use of what forms them and the, and, and the media through which they use it is, is a distinction with a difference. And to, to bring it home, let me put the following proposition on the table. Uh, I think at this point, we want leaders who know how to interact with and use popular culture. We certainly do not want leaders who are formed by popular culture in the way that Jefferson and Adams were formed by the classics. Uh, but what are, the perp what are the political purposes in American democracy of engaging with popular culture? And I, here's my uh, rough inventory. Well, first of all, you know, in a democratic society, manifesting democratic equality and your consistent and your commitment to it is very important politically. You cannot be seen as putting on airs. You cannot be seen to be saying, I'm better than my fellow citizens. Uh, and the more high-born you are, the more important it is to send that message, at least today. My favorite example of this is FDR. You know, he invited the King, of Queen, King and Queen of England over in the mid-1930s, took him to Hyde Park, fed him hot dogs. This was front page news in the New York Times. The American people loved it. And guess what? The King and Queen of England loved it as well. I mean, they could sit through stuffy banquets you know, in, you know, in Buckingham Palace. That's not, that's not why they came to Hyde Park. But it was front page news in the New York Times because it conveyed a very important message to the American people. You know, here was a president who was one of them, who didn't have to put on airs to impress even visiting royalty simply by being s proudly and straightforwardly an American. One could send the appropriate messages to high and low as well. But that raises a very interesting question. You know, if, if one distinguishes in a rough and ready way between popular and unpopular, that is to say high culture, uh, there is the example of John F. Kennedy, and Tevi talks about in his, this in his book, who deliberately tries to send the message that he is more of a highbrow than he actually is. Now, what is that all about in a democracy? Why is it deemed to be politically significant and beneficial to send that sort of message? And that raised the following question in my mind. Even in modern democratic increasingly, you know, America increasingly suffused by popular culture, have Americans entirely lost their taste for aristocracy? You know, and I'm not just talking about masterpiece theater. Is it out of the question that, that, an, American, uh, that an American politician who presents himself not as being part of popular culture, but, as, but having an important dimension that rides above it and maybe even in opposition to it, is it impossible in the 21st century for such a politician to get a hearing? I'm not sure. I think there may be a pent-up taste 
for at least a tincture of aristocracy in, in one of our future leaders. We shall see. Another important dimension, uh, 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 rationale for identification with popular, popular culture is what might be called generational identification, the I get it factor, the I'm, a, I'm one of you factor. Why is this important? Well, political science, I think, has demonstrated pretty conclusively, indeed it's one of the few things that political science has demonstrated pretty conclusively, that there are real generations in American politics formed by distinctive generational experiences. And they can be, you know, they can be grave experiences like uh, the Depression, World War II, 9-11, but there can also be a cultural dimension. You know, as we found out in the 1960s, the music that you listen to is a very important generational marker. And by indicating familiarity with the next generation's music, you're sending them an important message, not just about what you know, but about who you are. And the inability to connect with an emerging generation is usually the kiss of death for an American politician. And I could give lots of, exa lots of examples of that. The third reason for engaging with popular culture is a point that has been underscored by my friend, the political scientist Sam Popkin, in a wonderful book, you know, almost 20 years old now, called The Reasoning Voter. And what he argues in that book, among other things, is that voters use what he calls low information heuristics, you know, shortcuts, you know, rather than reading through policy papers or familiarizing, familiar, familiarizing themselves with candidates' biographies, they use shortcuts to try to figure out what kind of person a particular politician is. And, you know, Sam pointed out that one of the defining moments in the 1976 presidential campaign was Gerald Ford going to a state fair in Texas and trying unsuccessfully to eat an unshucked tamale. Okay, now, there you are in Texas with, even then, a very large Hispanic electorate. The message that Ford sent to that piece of the electorate was he had no idea who they were, how they lived. Uh, in case, by the way, you're noticing a proliferation of food references in this commentary, it's because I think food is a very important part of popular culture. And the, one of the few aspects of popular culture this book doesn't underscore, underscore enough. Uh, engagement with popular culture is an easy form of political bonding, right? Because it provides a, provides a quick common ground. Uh, and if you're dealing with lots of different people on a, on a daily basis, being able to rely on a kind of prefabricated common ground, at least to break the ice and get the discussion of other topics going, can be extremely useful. And politicians, politicians who can't do that, I think, are at a real, if you want me to be highfalutin for a minute, dialogic disadvantage. Uh, now, here's my last point. Uh, a key part of contemporary popular culture, and Tevi underscored this, is what I will call the culture of self-disclosure. You know, it's a culture that not only permits and facilitates and enables, but to some extent demands self-disclosure. And this is, I think, a very revealing fact. One of the things that it reveals, and I'll, you know, and I'll put this in a way that Harvey Mansfield Jr. would not find edgy enough, let me, you know, let me call it evolving conceptions of manhood and manliness. We can symbolize that by the transformation, by the shift from Gary Cooper to Alan Alda, you know, from the, the, the strong, silent type you know, to the endlessly sharing type, the man who refuses to reveal his feelings to one who wears them on his sleeve. And that is, I think, a very important fact 
about American popular culture. And it not only demands self-disclosure, uh, but it enables it in ways that I personally find quite disturbing frequently. But that raises a final question that's parallel to the first question that I put on the table, namely, do have Americans entirely lost their taste for what I will call dignified reserve? Mm. It is, is it impossible, is it impossible to say in, you know, in the second decade of the 21st century uh, that something is not only none of the people's business, but beneath the dignity of the president and the presidency or any other senior elected official to discuss publicly. What kind of cost would someone who wants to be president incur if he, or I must now say she, uh, you know, refused to answer the famous boxers v. briefs question? Uh, couldn't you make points with the American people you know, by saying, this has gone too far, right? There's a distinction between the public and the private, even for a public person, and being able to enforce that distinction is part of what it means to be a good public person and a good public leader. And if it means disappointing all of the talk shows, is it possible to stiff them? Is it possible to pay that communications price and still succeed in contemporary American politics? Because if you go on those shows, you're going to be faced with those kinds of questions and you will look churlish if you don't respond to them with some generosity. So, is, you know, so one of the questions that Tebby's book leaves me with is whether technology has made certain sorts of moral stances in public life prohibitively expensive to maintain? And if so, what does that mean for our democracy? Bill, thank you very much. <laughs> Mona. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you to the Hudson Institute and to Tevi for writing this very, very stimulating and interesting anecdote-rich book. Um, Bill had a sinking feeling in the green room when we were discussing pop culture. I had a sinking feeling when Tevi was speaking because he referenced several of the anecdotes that I was going to relate, um, which reminds me of that, you know, joke about the prisoners, you know, a new prisoner comes into the jail and, you know, he's sitting there in the evening and he hears them calling out from one cell to the other, you know, 11 and everybody laughs or, you know, 17, everybody laughs. What's going on? Well, we've all been here so long. We know all the jokes. So now we just call out the numbers and everybody laughs. And he says, oh, really? Can I try it? Sure, go ahead. And he says, five. And there's silence. What went wrong? Some people don't know how to tell a joke. <laughs> um, so I, I will begin by, by saying I, I feel like I want to shout out number five uh, because I would like to start by mentioning that one aspect of Tevi's book, which I enjoyed tremendously but which I found a little bit depressing, is the sections in which he outlines the erudition of our founding presidents. Um, it, uh, it reminded me of what um, Henry Adams said in his autobiography, The Education of Henry Adams. He was reflecting on the march of presidents from Washington to his day, and he wrote <clears throat> that 2,000 years after Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar, a man like Grant should be called and should actually and truly be the highest product of the most advanced evolution made evolution ludicrous. The progress of evolution from President Washington to President Grant was evidence enough to upset Darwin. <laughs> now, we tend to give Grant a lot more credit in our time, I guess mostly because of his wonderful memoir, um, which uh, Adams hadn't seen when he wrote that. But, um, but we can understand this lament, especially when we see the behavior of some of our presidents, some of our recent presidents. Um, now, Tevi mentioned uh, George Washington and, uh, and the, uh, the vast reading that Adams and Jefferson both did, that they were familiar with Latin and Greek. Um, he didn't mention but could have their um, fantastic correspondence that 
carried on for the last 14 years of their lives, um, which is fantastic reading. Um, first of all, the knitting together of an often tense relationship between two men who had been at odds many times in their lives, but also um, their discussion of books, of ideas, and they were brought back together by a love of country and by their tremendous, I mean, the, who could be jo Thomas Jefferson's pen pal? Who was on his level in the whole world? There was really only one guy, uh, and that was John Adams, uh, which, is, which is really uh, amazing to consider. Um, Tevi also mentioned John Quincy. Um, he was described by David McCullough as uh, perhaps the most brilliant human being who ever occupied the executive office. His tastes were definitely elite. Uh, again, quoting Tevi, quote, as president, he enjoyed poetry, literature, theater, opera, and translating Latin texts. I'm sure that's just the way Obama spends his Saturday <laughs> afternoons. Um, not to be too partisan, I, there's no recent president uh, who could possibly uh, compete with Quincy Adams. Uh, but I think we do get now to a nub of, uh, of Tevi's book. Um, namely that in a democratic republic, successful politicians must have or must learn to fake the common touch. Um, the man who unseated Quincy Adams, as Tevi told us, Andrew Jackson, somewhat crude, unlettered, very notoriously bad speller, but, um, but knew how to use that uh, to his advantage in the story that Tevi told. The only Latin I know is E Pluribus Unum. So that was game, set, and match. And it set the template for everything that followed. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, though a wealthy man and a remarkable intellect himself, um, he published his first book the year he graduated from Harvard, um, didn't make the mistake of being like Quincy Adams. He styled himself an outdoorsman, a pugilist, both literally and figuratively, a rancher, a colonel, a naturalist, an explorer. Um, Tevi tells a great story in the book about, uh, about him uh, when he was out west, the Dakota Territory, and he'd gone to Montana, and he was in a bar, and he actually decked a bully. Um, and he was quite proud of it. He wrote about it. He said, a hard right to one side of the point of his jaw, hitting with my left as I straightened out, and then again with my right, you know, very TR-ish. Um, and there's never a shortage of great Teddy Roosevelt stories. Um, another uh, one from his adventures in the West, uh, where he did earn the respect of the uh, cowboys uh, for, for learning their ways and enduring their hardships with him. Uh, they know, and they, you know, they teased him a little bit. They called him Four Eyes because he had glasses. But they, they did accept him as one of their own. But uh, there is a story that... Uh, you couldn't quite take the Manhattan grandee out of the boy completely, even when he was out in the Dakotas. And one of them recalled for a, a biographer that they would nearly double over sometimes when they were on a hard ride and TR would shout, hasten quickly forward there, boys. <clears throat> now, um, I take from Teddy's book, uh, from Tevi's book, that Teddy Roosevelt was pretty much the last Republican president of the United States to be well treated by the popular culture. The 1960s saw the advent of the culture wars and the clear side choosing of writers, entertainers, musicians, and other cultural arbiters. Uh, Richard Nixon, uh, the exception who proves the rule about the common touch. <laughs> Um, made some ham-fisted attempts to, um, to connect with the culture. He invited Elvis to the White House, um, and he suggested to his staff that he wanted to have a jazz evening at the White House. He said, you know, we'll have all the jazz greats, like um, Guy Lombardo. <laughs> um, actually, Duke Ellington was a genuine Republican, and, and Nixon gave him the Medal of Freedom, but that didn't get him any street cred. Uh, so... By the 1970s, um, most pop musicians were leaning left. If Republicans attempted to use a popular song uh, as a campaign theme, as Reagan found when he attempted to use a Bruce Springsteen number, and as Bush found when H.W. Bush found when he tried to use a Bobby McFerrin tune, they got slapped down. Um, and that pattern persists. We've seen it again and again in recent history with uh, other Republicans, McCain, 
Michelle Bachman, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> the one realm of popular entertainment that is not ferociously anti-Republican in the 21st century is country music. Uh, but while country music continues to thrive, uh, it is dwarfed by other genres. Uh, I looked this up. In 2012, country music and gospel sold 16.5 million digital albums. So you compare that with the combined total for rock, rap, R&B, metal, and new age of 81.9 million. So 16 million to 80 million. Uh, the results are similar in other cultural venues, movies, television, theater. Republicans and conservatives find themselves ghettoized with few sympathetic artists or creative minds in their increasingly isolated corner. So many conservatives, I think, are tempted by a variant of Timothy Leary's 1960s slogan, turn on, tune in, drop out, without the drug implications. Uh, uh, Tevi quotes George W. Bush, who prided himself on not watching television, not watching. He said he hadn't seen Saturday Night Live. He hadn't seen uh, The Daily Show with uh, Jon Stewart. And he said tartly, they put an off button on the TV for a reason. So one can sympathize with uh, that sentiment from W. <clears throat> um, left to my own devices, I watch uh, Foil's War and uh, reruns of uh, the Jeeves and Worcester series. So that's my taste. And I understand that desire to just push it all away. But it's important to recognize the stakes and the dangers, I think, politically. Politics and culture, as Tevi points out, are intimately linked. And it's no accident that the one realm of culture not implacably hostile to Republicans is country music, which is very white, very Christian, and very ex-urban. <clears throat> now, Republicans cannot and should not try to do what Barack Obama does so successfully, which is be down with it all, be the cool kid. Okay? They, would get, they would get laughed out of town. It wouldn't work. Um, and arguably, it would violate some of their principles. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of cultural bilge out there uh, that is arguably damaging to our souls as well as our political health. Um, I felt the need recently to comment on the execrable Miley Cyrus. Uh, but it's also important to remember that not all of it is pernicious or corrupt. Um, and in any case, it is ubiquitous. Conservatives and Republicans should look for opportunities, I think, to praise what's good and, if necessary, condemn what they want to condemn and feel they must. But they have to be engaged. Um, they have to know what's going on. And they have to fight the perception that they're out of touch. So, as Tevi ably and entertainingly demonstrated in this book, popular culture will continue to influence politics. And uh, turning it off, while it may work for the Amish, um, Hasidic Jews, and former presidents, <laughs> Uh, it does not work for those who hope to win future elections. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Tevi, back to you. All right, I will uh, address the comments, which I appreciate, in reverse order. First, to Mona, thank you for your kind words both today in this forum, but also in, in your wonderful column today that everybody should see that's in multiple outlets, including the Examiner and Chicago Sun-Times and National Review, syndicated everywhere. So thank you for that. My pleasure. Uh, and I am flattered that she and I have the same taste in anecdotes, so I'm glad we <laughs> took, took a, a similar approach. I agree with her, and I think it is a theme of the book, that successful, successful presidents much, must have the common touch. And throughout the book, I try and cite examples of presidents who are successful at demonstrating that they have the common touch. One story I tell is of uh, Lincoln, who uh, before he was running for president, but in his lawyer days, he's presented with Latin on, uh, in a court case. And not dissimilarly from the Jackson story, he says, if that's Latin, you'd better get yourself another witness. I also tell the story of Ronald Reagan, who at one point was reading a serious work of nonfiction, and his press secretary, Marlon Fitzwater, said to him, well, maybe we should get it out there that you're reading this book to kind of counter the general view of you. And he said, no, Marlon, I don't think we need to do that. So there's definitely a sense among presidents that, that they need to understand that common touch and appeal to the common man. 
As for this notion of politics and cu culture, I, Mona is correct to diagnose that I, I'm, I point that this is a, an increasing phenomenon since the 1960s and that different presidents have tried to combat it, different Republican presidents have tried to combat it with different results. I tell the story about Nixon trying to appropriate country music on his behalf also, and I, I talk about Merle Haggard, who had written this song called Oki from Muskogee, and it highlighted all the things that Nixon saw as liberal excess, including pot smoking and draft dodging and the like. And he said, why don't we get him over to the White House? And, and uh, Merle Haggard did come to the White House and did sing a song. He wasn't much of a Republican, actually, but he did come and he, and he did perform. And uh, Haldeman later noted in his diary that uh, it wasn't much an event because most of the people in the crowd, you know, sort of the elite Washington crowd, had never heard of any of Merle Haggard's songs. And the only one that they had all resonated, that all resonated with them was Oki from Muskogee. So you have to have the common touch, you have to be aware of the culture, but you have to be careful about how you do it. In terms of Bill's thoughtful comments, the, the point on which I will most disagree with him is the notion that he doesn't belong on this panel. I think he ably represented himself, even if he wasn't keeping up with our Breaking Bad and Seinfeld references in the green room. Uh, he says that there is a distinction, and I agree it's an important one, between presidents and the way they are viewed and what forms and media through which they use it. And it's something that throughout the book I did try and address this distinction, and the way I addressed it is I tried to point to both, that it is important how presidents are formed and what the cultural influences were on them, but also how they use media to project their images. And oftentimes, a president who is informed by a medium, like Barack Obama was informed by television at a very young age, I tell story in the book. In fact, I quote it directly from his memoir, so no one can accuse me of partisanship, but I talk about how he, when he came home from school, and it was, he went to the elite Punahou school in Hawaii, he would come home from school and he would watch cartoons, then he would watch sitcom reruns, then he would watch primetime television with his grandfather until it was time for the Johnny Carson show, at which time he would retire to his bedroom and listen to top 40 music on the radio. So that is a very pop culture informed childhood, and I would argue that his strong knowledge of the popular culture has helped him in his use of popular media today. He is, he is not faking it when he talks about the media, my snooky story notwithstanding. He, he knows of what he speaks. Uh, I, I would agree with Bill that we do want leaders who can use pop culture but are not necessarily formed by it, although Barack Obama has, has managed to, uh, to do both. But we don't want to think about a president who's watching reality TV or, uh, or, or spending all their time watching music videos. There, there's good reasons to hope that the president's not doing those things. And I really, uh, really appreciated Bill's point about um, Kennedy showing himself as more highbrow as president than he really was. And for that, I would urge you to look at my first book, which is on intellectuals in the American presidency. And I talk about Kennedy's masterful use and appeal to the intellectual community. And it's kind of interesting that in that book, Kennedy is kind of the hero. Kennedy, I argue, in the first book, used intellectuals better than any other president, and every subsequent president modeled themselves to some degree on Kennedy's use of intellectuals. In this book, in some ways, Kennedy's almost the villain. I wouldn't say he's a full-out villain, but I criticize him the most because I think in many ways he was faking it with culture. Um, in the Pablo Casals dinner, where he had all of the elites come together to watch the, the famed Spanish cellist appear the, in the U.S. for the first time in 40 years, Kennedy had to have handwritten notes in front of him to tell him when to clap at a, at a classical music performance. His, the famous book that he supposedly wrote, uh, Profiles in Courage, uh, I, I think it's pretty clear from the historical re evidence that I look at that he didn't really write that book. Uh, he, they talk a, a lot about Kennedy and... Hollywood, and what I argue in the book is that he liked ho Hollywood starlets more than he liked Hollywood movies. And in fact, the number of starlets with whom he was associated rivals the number of movies that he actually watched when he was in the White House. Uh, he, he saw about 48 movies when he was in the White House in about three years, whereas Jimmy Carter saw as many, 10 times as many movies as Kennedy. He saw 480 movies in a single term. So Kennedy really uh, by the, the reckoning of a number of close aides uh, who, whom I cite in the book, really just didn't have the patience to sit through cultural performances, and he liked talking to and engaging with people. And in fact, there are stories of people in the bureaucracy a couple of levels down who would get phone calls from Kennedy who was trying to reach out and find out what was going on. He really liked engaging with people. He didn't have patience for culture. Uh, 
Bill also makes the, the good point about food. And I actually did have that Franklin Roosevelt hot dog story in an, in an early version of the book, but it was off topic, so I didn't include it. But I will note that uh, Paula Scheuer, who is a famous uh, cookbook writer and expert baker, uh, the kosher baker, and she and I were emailing yesterday, and we agreed that a, a possible sequel to this would be noshing in the White House, <laughs> talking about president's relations in food. So if <laughs> publishers are watching, Paula and I are ready to co-author that one. <laughs> And then, finally, on Bill's point about... Three chapters on Clinton. <laughs> That's true. He did, he did eat all sorts of food. But uh, uh, about this issue of dignified reserve, is it gone forever? It certainly appears to be gone for right now. And the Obama approach has the upper hand. But will it always be thus? Uh, I'm not prepared to say that. I think presidents do need to <coughs> engage with pop culture, be aware of pop culture, but... I don't think they necessarily need to be as self-revelatory as we've seen some of our recent presidents be. And George W. Bush did have that approach of, I'm not going to engage in pop culture. I'm not going to bare my soul on TV. I'm not going to be on some of these shows. I'm not going to watch TV. Now, Bush certainly had his challenges and definitely left with a low approval rating, but he also successfully won two terms. So it, it, there may be an avenue for a president to take that approach in the future. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Jonah, Jonah's response, which uh, was, was, was quite thoughtful, and, uh, and I appreciate it. Now, Jonah and I are good friends, as he said, for uh, 20 years, and we've had many a conversation and argument about pop culture and politics in that time, uh, sometimes over beer, sometimes not. Uh, You've never been right. <laughs> <laughs> Until now, right? Uh, and Jonah is correct to note that my book is an implicit defense of reading. Uh, I, Maybe some might call it a Straussian form of misdirection or something like that. But, uh, but I, I focus on reading as important. I think presidents should read. They should read serious works. They should read history. They should read biography. And I think it makes them better leaders and better informed people. But I also recognize that we live in a pop culture age. And you can't win. You can't make it to president and have the opportunity to read these books and have them inform your governing until you have an understanding of the culture and convey that understanding. For better or for worse, pop culture is our common vernacular. Now, Jonah says that the, my, the greatest flaw in my book is that I don't heap enough abuse on the progressives. If you want abuse heaped on the progressives, I urge you to read Jonah's book, Liberal <laughs> Fascism, which has lots of it. But even in this point, I will say that culture helps to define and understand the presidents. Jonah dislikes uh, Wilson because many of his uh, political sins, and I think he's accurate in recounting many of them. But at the same time, Wilson is viewed for a, through a cultural lens, and in some ways is seen as, a, in many ways, in most quarters, is seen as a successful president because of who controls the culture and who defines the reputations of presidents. Now, Jonah's working very hard to change that. I understand that. But what I found in the book, and what actually humbled me in finding out the book, is that every president, in some degree, has had to deal with popular culture at the time, and every cult president subsequently has been defined by the culture both of that time and subsequently. And to get back to my initial distinction between Cicero and Snooki, uh, I think Cicero, uh, Snooki might be out of bounds for presidents, and I'm not sure she's an appropriate person to be talking about, but Cicero was someone who was skilled in the art of persuasion, and wanted to use every available tool for persuading. And he used his voice. He worked very hard on speaking and learning how to speak in the appropriate way and trained his body and mind and voice in order to convey the points that he wanted to do. And he was very effective at doing so. And I would suspect that if he were in this era, he would look at all of the media we have and be envious and want to make the most and greatest advantage of all of them. Jonah suggests that... <coughs> I don't wear enough of a partisan hat in this book. And <coughs> I take some pride in that because I was trying not to have a partisan hat wearing this book. But let me put on a partisan hat for a moment here and say from the Republican perspective, I think that the Republicans need to understand the pop culture and to understand the pop culture better than they have been doing so in recent elections. Mitt Romney, who I supported and I worked, worked on that campaign, when he made references to pop culture, he, he's, one of his big references was to Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which I think is a very funny movie, but it's a, a movie, it's, <laughs> it's dated, it is, you know, it's a 19, I believe 1986 80s. movie. Yeah. 
um, he talked about Seinfeld, which Joan and I talk about a lot. And it's also that those references to Seinfeld are two decades old. If you look at the fantastic Twitter feed, Modern Seinfeld, it is made up of Seinfeld plots that could not have existed in the days of Seinfeld. So it's all about Jerry and George and Elaine and Kramer interacting with Twitter or Facebook or Reddit or Instagram, things that the people in the Seinfeld era, which wasn't that long ago, had never heard of. And so presidents need to be a little more up to date than, than Governor Romney showed himself in the last election. And in fact, I think they could learn from Jonah, who can ably quote both Edmund Burke and groundskeeper Willie when it comes to issues of foreign policy. And so closing with Jonah's comments about best of us, I think if Republicans are knowledgeable about pop culture and successful in the use of it, they can once again make the presidency a festivus for the rest of us. <laughs> now bring on the feats of strength. Thank you. <laughs> Jonah, Bill, Mona, any uh, sir rebuttals uh, that you'd like to offer? Otherwise, okay. Okay. Well, but before we do, since I've got the microphone, uh, I want to uh, say a couple things, my own uh, reaction to what I've listened to and to the book, a few brief points. Um, on uh, Bill Galston's distinction between uh, uh, culture that uh, shapes leaders and uh, the leader's use of uh, culture for political purposes, uh, one, one thing that I did not know, one thing that I learned from... Uh, uh, from Tevi's book that I'd not really sufficiently realized is that our most successful presidents have been voracious readers. Uh, and uh, I think if we actually did, uh, if we lined them up a lot, along with a lot of the presidents that he doesn't mention at all, uh, we would find a, uh, a very strong pattern. But he talks, he, he goes out of his way to point out uh, the enormous capacity uh, for leading, and I'm talking about since the uh, Jefferson, uh, since since the Jackson era uh, inaugurated uh, dem the the Democratic small D Democratic presidency, uh, Lincoln, uh, Roosevelt, Roosevelt, and Reagan are, were all huge uh, leaders uh, readers, and their political ideas were clearly uh, decisively formed uh, uh, by what they. Uh, by what they read. I want uh, to, I want to say a word on behalf of JFK. I think that there are uh, uh, things such as the, uh, the faking of, uh, of uh, profiles and courage, uh, which are uh, worthy of uh, sharp criticism. Uh, but uh, uh, the president is creating a public image. Uh, and uh, I think that faking it uh, was a, I, I find it admirable uh, that somebody who did not uh, know who Pablo Casals was uh, had the wit to have him to the White House and was trained uh, so that he could appear that he was appreciating it. I remember uh, as a teenager being impressed by that and wondering who Pablo Casals was and, uh, and following the president's lead. Uh, having Robert Frost, a serious poet, uh, at your uh, uh, inaugural uh, was another, and there were many others. And I think that that was uh, uh, demonstrating exactly the kind of cultural leadership uh, that would be uh, a good thing if we had more of. <clears throat> I've been trying to think of examples in response to Bill's uh, talk of uh, presidents, or often, I think, uh, presidents' uh, wives, uh, 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 go, trying to exert a little bit of cultural leadership, going against the culture. Uh, and I think of uh, uh, Michelle Obama's uh, obesity uh, program, uh, which was similar to JFK's and RFK's uh, fitness program. Uh, get off the couch, get up and do things, and get in shape, and, and uh, uh, pay attention to, uh, uh, to, uh, to physical fitness. Uh, Vice President Al Gore's wife, uh, uh, engaged in a vigorous and highly controversial campaign against uh, violent uh, misogynist uh, lyrics uh, in uh, popular uh, music that got a great deal of attention. Um, I remember that in the, it was a week before Obama was inaugurated, uh, he was uh, in an interview talking about the uh, culture of uh, African American young men in America, and he went out of his way to tell them to pull up their pants. He says the brothers should uh, hitch up their pants and get rid of this uh, low-rise uh, prison uh, 
uh, affect. I don't know uh, that he has uh, said uh, too much about uh, about uh, rap music or uh, the uh, particularly uh, offensive uh, and degrading aspects of uh, popular music uh, in all of his commentary, but that would be an obvious uh, there would be an obvious opportunity for him there. Um, I wish Ronald Reagan had gotten a little bit more in this book. Uh, I think that he was a pretty good cultural uh, arbiter, uh, and he did not want to uh, engage in any uh, uh, disinformation about uh, hoity-toity books that he was reading, but he was a master of creating the visual uh, image, the low information uh, heuristic uh, about the nature of the presidency, being up on horseback with Queen Elizabeth and standing in front of uh, uh, the uh, standing uh, uh, in front of the Berlin Wall or at uh, on the shores of the D-Day uh, invasion and so forth. He thought about his words very, very uh, carefully. And he was something of an arbiter having of culture, having come from Hollywood and uh, Los Angeles. Uh, he would uh, he would more than he, he, more than once I can remember him criticizing uh, the mores of contemporary uh, movies. Uh, and sometimes he'd sound a little priggish, but it, it never really sounded priggish. Uh, he was criticizing there's so much sex in movies today. He said, when I was in Hollywood, uh, the, the great sex scene would be uh, the uh, man and woman going inside, uh, going inside a door of a hotel and dropping the do not disturb sign on the handle. So, you know, the, it played to your imagination. And it was actually pretty, pretty literate uh, criticism. <coughs> when, but on the other hand, when uh, the Secretary of uh, the Interior, uh, Jim Watt, uh, canceled the Beach Boys uh, performance uh, on the mall uh, because he wanted to have, on the 4th of July, because he wanted some wholesome family entertainment. <coughs> he was publicly and very humiliatingly uh, overruled the next day by Nancy Reagan, who was a great Beach Boys fan. Uh, so, he had, so, he had, so he had a great, great sensitivity uh, to the culture, and he could set standards, uh, but he could also uh, appreciate it. Uh, finally, <clears throat> when I think about uh, Tevi's explanation of how the culture has become uh, fragmented, and there are lots of channels, and there are op lots of opportunities for segmentation. My uh, my old guy's worry to match uh, Bill Galston's uh, old guy guy's worry is this: I like a president who has to talk to everybody all at once. Uh, that envision that encompasses a certain discipline that I like, and I think of as important for a democratic leader. He has to has to lead in a way that he's leading everybody, and he's talking to all of us. And I worry a little bit that where you can set up these channels where they're, you know, communicating political operatives or communicating the president's message almost by zip codes uh, and all sorts of various uh, narrow channels, uh, that our presidents could become sort of scripted automatons. Uh, and be able to escape uh, this necessity to speak uh, in a purely democratic voice to the whole nation. So those were my uh, uh, reactions listening to all of these uh, wonderful presentations. Now we're going to turn it over. Can I just make a few points on that? What? Can I just make a few quick points on that? No. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, please. Uh, yes. So uh, a, a couple of points. First of all, uh, I just want to rebut one comment that Chris made that some presidents not mentioned at all. Actually, every president is mentioned at least once in the book. Okay. Careful to make sure okay. I did Sorry. that. Um, <coughs> Second of all, on the faking it is admirable. Kennedy was certainly successful in the faking it regard. And one of the important points I make in the book is about the filtration effect. That what we talk about, even what I'm talking about in this book, isn't always necessarily everything the presidents read or watched because we can't know that. They watch it alone in a dark room or they read it in their bedroom. What we can talk about is what we know that they watched. And that I recognize, and I note in the book, is filtered to some degree by themselves and their aides. And, the, and Bill, Bill Clinton, for example, would read three to four mysteries a week, but he didn't highlight those books that he was reading as mysteries in, in his presidency. He, he highlighted the serious nonfiction he was reading, and, and I guess he, he is to be ap applauded for that. Um, on the segmentation point, one argument I make in the book is that while we are becoming increasingly segmented into s separate narrow audiences, one of the few cultural touchstones we have today is now the president. 
It's one of the reasons why the most common subject of jokes on the late night talk shows is the president, because it's something that everybody knows about and everybody can relate to. And there's, no, as I said earlier, there's no one show, there's no one song, there's no one movie that everybody watches anymore. And so I think the presidents in that uh, sort of have a special responsibility to try and get past just their political short-term needs and try to elevate their tones and speak to the nation. I'm going to call on people. If you could please uh, wait until the microphone arrives and then uh, introduce yourself very briefly and ask your question. Yes, sir. Milton Grun Grunfeld, I would just like to challenge the proposition that conservatives have any business trying to be part of popular culture uh, in America today. I would say for the past half century at least, the popular culture is fundamentally revolutionary, transgressive, base. Uh, it's not what conservatives are about. Uh, I think using the media, which is a neutral thing, uh, the media can be used in any, any sort of fashion by any, any group, but I think um, to try to um, become part of a, a culture which is opposed to us, essentially, is a foolish idea. Um, so, and the fact, and, and, and the notion we have to do it to get with the swim of things, I would say uh, Ron Paul and Rand Paul disprove that. I haven't seen them stooped to any kind of popular culture uh, business, but yet they seem to have a great deal of pull with, with people who agree with their principles. Jonah, that's for you. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 I I would say I disagree with about 92% of that. Um, the, um, I agree with you that the, there's a lot in the culture that is, a, that is uh, hostile to conservatives. Um, I don't dispute that for a moment. And uh, one of the things that drives me crazy when I was listening to Mona, Mona's remarks, she, she's absolutely right. You know, it, it's funny how Ryan, Paul Ryan and Marco Rubio, when the New York Times got a hold of their iPod playlists, um, they immediately tried to hold them against them. Don't they know that Nine Inch Nails are dedicated communists and all that? And, and as if it was hypocritical for them to like that music. And they never followed through on the logical upshot of that, which is that if liberals listen to that, so they, they agree with you know, the communism in that, or can't you just like it because it's music um, that, that, that speaks to you on some other level? Um, I agree there's a lot of what social scientists call crap in the popular culture. Um, but there's also a lot more good stuff in there than, uh, than conservatives are often either aware of or willing to acknowledge. Um, I have, the, as Tevi mentioned, I wrote a cover story about Breaking Bad a couple issues back for National Review. I not only think it's the best television show on, uh, currently on air, or maybe ever, um, it is also a profoundly conservative show in terms of what it shows about the, the moral de degradation um, that comes with lying, that comes with breaking outside of conventional morality and all of the rest. Um, you can find, all, you know, it's one of these points that I think is lost in a lot of people, there's a, enormous amounts of pro-life messages in the popular culture. And conservatives, particularly pro-life activists, never really seize on it as much as they should. I think there are a lot of issues that end up in the popular culture that conservatives just leave the chips on the table rather than trying to celebrate these things. Uh, on the pro-life side, you know, every sitcom since Maud, Maud was the only one that had a character actually have an abortion, and it's one of the reasons why that show was so awful. Um, <laughs> but every, ever since then, any time a character gets pregnant, she always agonizes about her choice. And then the second, and she, but she always decides to keep the baby, and the second she decides to keep the baby, some profound metaphysical, ontological transformation occurs and she starts treating it like a human being even though it's still the same fetus it was five seconds ago and that message plays out across the culture that um i mean i, I think it's there's something nichean and bad about this idea that the mother decides it's a human being either it is or it isn't you know but at the same time there is the, the way they talk about the decision to have the baby is much more pro-life than it is pro-choice in a lot of ways um, but regardless one reason why conservatives should engage in the popular culture it's because it's our culture too. And if, you know, the, the point of a magazine like National Review or the point of the conservative movement isn't simply to elect Republicans, it's actually to move the country in a conservative direction. And it's very difficult to do that unless you ha find a way to engage in the vernacular that young people are speaking in, if you find a way to sort of uh, get to persuade the society and not just one political party to move rightward. And I, I don't know that you can do that unless you're at least modestly fluent with where the popular culture is. Well said. 
Yes, ma'am. Jennifer Mizrahi. So fabulous presentations. And you really talked about two separate categories, how people use pop culture to develop their own ideology, and then how they took that ideology and sold it through popular culture. But one out of five Americans has a disability, and you don't really see presidents throughout history talk about it. And Tevi, you talked about the one president who had a real visible disability hiding it. So I wondered what you learned about the presidents and how they either learned about people with disabilities or wanted to speak to them or about them. Yeah, Jennifer, thank you for that question, and thank you for the good work you do on behalf of children with disabilities. Uh, I think that it is a, a theme that you correctly pick up on, that uh, presidents, should they have disabilities, don't advertise it. And you remember the, the big argument about whether to show Franklin Delano Roosevelt in his wheelchair in his memorial, and they kind of, I guess, elided by having the cape cover the wheelchair, but he, but he is there. Um, w one thing that I found that I didn't know in the book is that some people thought uh, Woodrow Wilson may have been dyslexic because he was so late to start reading. but. It seems to me that a common theme you'll find is that uh, to the extent that there have been presidents with disabilities, let's say uh, Wilson's dyslexia or, um, or Roosevelt's uh, wheelchair, it is not something that they advertise from the, uh, fr from the bully pulpit or from the, the presidential podium. And getting to Bill's point about the self-revelatory uh, nature of the modern presidency, perhaps that is something we will see more of in the future. I would just add, just very quickly, I, um, my husband and I are very involved in the adoption world, and um, the Bush administration in particular, and I'm sure the Clintons did this too, uh, in fact, Hillary Clinton came to one of our events, um, they've been very supportive of adopting uh, children with handicaps, um, so they have provided White House venues and so on and so forth. Now, that doesn't, you know, maybe it's not as much uh, attention as could have been given, but it hasn't been entirely neglected, I would say. Mm. Uh, that's a that's a terrific question, and it raises the fo following question in my mind. In today's media culture, is it conceivable that a wheelchair-bound president could conceal that fact from the American people for a day? No. No. Now, Maybe a day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, and so that, you know, and that's what I meant when I suggested that changes in communica communications have made certain forms of reticence technologically impossible, right? And, but, and that's, but that raises a very important question. Roosevelt knew what he was doing, right? Because he thought that in the cultural context of his own time, that disclosing a fact which in fact had no negative bearing on his capacity to lead might, you know, you know, might disable him to become President of the United States and prevent him from doing so. What does that tell us? Uh, and you know, what, it, you know, what it tells me is that taken too far, you know, a culture and a communications environment of full disclosure may end up highlighting facts about individuals that deprive us of their services, even though we'd be very well served to have those services. So the culture of disclosure enacts a governance price. It's not just morally distasteful. It makes a real difference, and I think not a positive one. Um. Thank you to the entire panel for your excellent presentations. My name is Adam Kuyper. Uh, Tevi, congratulations on the book. Um, I appreciate your remarks about the uh, Michael Bay movie mentioning uh, FDR, showing FDR in a wheelchair. Probably the first time that Michael Bay, uh, the, the explodious director in Hollywood who's responsible for the Transformer movies, has ever been praised for historical verisimilitude. Or um, anything else. Yeah, or really much of anything else. I'm not uh, sure I was praising him, but... Uh. So I, I'm the editor of a journal, The New Atlantis, a journal about technology uh, and science, and I'd like to focus on the technological aspects that's kind of threaded through several of the remarks here. I just wonder if looking forward, I don't, I'm not asking for technological projections into the future, but looking forward, whether we might see any trends uh, to kind of continue the story. I mean, uh, Chris's remarks kind of pointed out a little bit uh, the, the, the fragmentation and segmentation that, that you talked about, Tevi, pointed out how it, it will have a kind of cost 
on governance. It could have a cost uh, on governance. And I wonder, you know, a decade or two from now when we have a president who has been raised entirely in the era of fragmented, segmented media, you know, to this point, we, we haven't yet. You know, President Obama was watching the same cartoons that children elsewhere in the country were watching. But a decade or two from now, is it possible that we'll have presidents who, you know, are just not really able to communicate with other, other parts of the culture just because they're not literate uh, in those other parts of the culture? Or to, to turn to some of what Bill was talking about, about uh, kind of rise of uh, our virtual intimacy with the, 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 the president. I wonder whether, uh, you know, the, among the costs, uh, I, I wonder whether there's a countervailing force here, whether uh, 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 people are increasingly savvy about uh, uh, fake kinds of intimacy, about the, the, the falsity of certain kinds of media intimacy, the kind of ploys, uh, you know, it's, if somebody brings, uh, if, if a president brings someone to the White House today, uh, it's going to be understood to be a gesture, an intentional gesture, and there's all sorts of second guessing and analysis, even more than there was when Pablo Casales came, about why this, this, was, hap why this was done, why, why this person was brought. So th I wonder whether kind of media savvy among voters and out in the polity generally uh, you know, kind of pushes back against some of the, the fake intimacy that uh, social media and other technologies might encourage. Let, let me make a couple of points to that. For, first of all, thank you, Adam, for not only your question, but for your support for this book project. Before I even had an agent on it, you always liked this idea and you pushed me on it and to keep going, so thank you. In terms of the question of whether there is a new technological chapter to be written, I am quite confident that there is one. In fact, the story of America, and one of the stories I'm trying to tell in this book, is the story of new technological frontiers that are challenging the president, challenging the people, and challenging us to figure out how to deal with them, how to adapt to them. So there is a new chapter to be written. However, I don't know what that chapter is, and perhaps readers of the New Atlantis will be ahead of the curve in figuring out what it is, but, but we, we don't know yet what it is. But it will challenge our ability to uh, not only um, communicate, but to relate to the president and also for the president to relate to the, the larger body. And that gets to your second point about this segmentation. We clearly are going to have a president in the future that is raised in this segmented culture who watches, let's say, only Fox News type outlets or only MSNBC type outlets and has a certain view of the world that doesn't understand or recognize. In fact, some can say that President Obama to some degree has this because of his... Um, uh, his, uh, he grew up in Hawaii, but then his mainland experience was in kind of elite northeastern uh, universities, and it gave him a certain view of the world. So I think you, we will see more of that in the future, and I, I think what presidents do to need to counteract it is to recognize on the things that not only make us uh, uh, American, but uniquely American, the, thing, the values that tie us together as a society. And if a president can do that, I think they can do very well indeed, even in a segmented world. Boy, Tibby, I think that's an important point. Uh, and uh, I, I just want to underscore it. And uh, just to put one mediocre credential on the table, uh, I was Walter Mondale's issues director for two and a half years during his presidential campaign. And so I know a fair amount about Ronald Reagan, the politician, the president, the campaigner. And I am convinced that an essential part of Reagan's broad appeal was that he grew up, you know, uh, as a member of a political party uh, that was not the party that he belonged to when he was elected president. This was a president who voted for FDR not once, not twice, not three times, but all four times. And so, you know, and, and so this massive phenomenon of Reagan Democrats in effect, Reagan was the first Reagan Democrat. <laughs> and the fact that he understood you know, the mindset, not only of his own party, but of, of the party that opposed him, I think is an enormous political asset. And, you know, and I agree with you. you know, the fact that President Obama grew up in a politically monochromatic environment uh, was, you know, despite all the foreign travel that he did as a youth, was a narrowing experience. By contrast, the fact that Bill Clinton grew up in profoundly conservative rural Arkansas, 
and didn't have to read books about what it meant to be in a small town that didn't have a very vigorous economy and where, you know, where, you know, you know, the Bible and guns weren't things that you just clung to, if I may drop a reference, but, you know, defined a way of life that had an integrity of its own, gave him an enormous capacity to appeal beyond the narrow base of his own political party. And so I think that capaciousness of experience is absolutely critical if you want to lead a country which in the best of circumstances will have at least 40% of the population that doesn't agree with you and may not like you very much. May, may I uh, comment on that? I think, I think you make an excellent point. Um, I, I would also say, though, that Obama is the counterexample. Uh, you're right. To be, Obama is the, is the counterexample. Reagan was able to win two landslides because he had this broad understanding of both sides, and he knew how to speak to the broad middle of the country. Only people on the extremes of either end didn't like him. Um, but Obama has demonstrated that you can do narrow casting. You can be very provincial, very conventionally left-wing. You don't have to read anything that the other side says. And you can still squeak out two victories. And you can still marginalize 48% of the population and be, you know, with the help of the press and the popular culture, as we've been discussing, you can still be successful in the sense of getting reelected. But can you govern? Hmm. Oh, you want that? <laughs> <laughs> I am old, you know, I am old fashioned enough to believe that an election campaign is an overture and, and that the play doesn't begin until the curtains go up. Yes, absolutely. And so the difference between, you know, a narrow, purely partisan victory and one that's brought, uh, one that is gained on a much broader basis is night and day as far as I'm concerned. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, I'm Arnold Kling. Please speak up. Okay, yeah. I'm Arnold Kling, and that, my question will take you back to the the intellectuals and wonks. Um, will are we, will the ever head, or we, are we already at the point where a qualification to be a Federal Reserve Chairman uh, is to be show that you're in touch with the people and correlate relate to popular culture? Uh, you know, Ben Bernanke, while he's bailing out the banks, they go out of their way to tell the story that he's going to Nationals games. And uh, Larry Summers, who seemed qualified to be a Fed chairman, probably had trouble relating to the people. So are, are the wonks and intellectuals going to be part of this game? Uh, th thank you for that question, Arnold. Uh, l let me suggest that we might be going in a different direction. As I say in the book, Harry Truman is our last president not to have a college degree. George H.W. Bush is our la the last president not to have a graduate degree. And Ronald Reagan is the last president not to have a degree from either Harvard or Yale or both. So perhaps we are moving in a more elitist direction intellectually at the same time that there's a coarsening in the culture. Jonah, one quick point. Um, getting back to Adam's question a little bit. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's in terms of the communications technology. I mean, maybe look them up with a, a, something Twitter, shorter than Twitter, and you only get four characters or something, right? <laughs> um, all abbreviations. <laughs> yeah, or, or maybe we'll always be like in the Matrix, and we'll just see the code, and we'll just make sense of it that way. Um, but uh, um, I do think we are on the verge of a profound societal transformation in term because of technology. And it's not necessarily because of communications technology, although maybe we'll get things beamed straight into our heads. The rise of big data which I think a lot of people can get extremely paranoid about, and only some of them are unjustified to be paranoid about it, um, is getting us to a point where large numbers of American people can be manipulated without knowing that anyone's even trying to manipulate them. It's very different than presidential rhetoric of the past, where you would hear a president say, um, my friends, don't listen to those bad guys, listen to me. It's now you have people who can get mail because of, or, or phone calls, or, or a embedded ads on the internet because of something they bought at Walmart. And they'll have no idea that their lives are being politically tracked or marketing tracked. Um, and that has huge reper repercussions. I also think uh, that we're going to have, mean, and this is a little off topic, but the, the rise of the driverless car, which I think is v much closer than people realize, will profoundly and permanently change American culture. Um, because all of a sudden, the second someone from outside of your car can take over your car, 
um, it's not really your car anymore, and you don't necessarily have to go. You ne won't necessarily go where you want to go all the time. And it's one thing to manipulate people with ideas. It's another thing to f physically transport them in directions that they don't want to go. Um, but I, I think that you know Arnold makes a very good point about the appealing to the sort of populism of the Fed chairman. I mean, this is if you read Julian Benda, he talks about how. Um, uh, the second the masses start to get political consciousness, the king becomes slaves to the becomes a slave to the masses. And it used to be up to the king to decide what was in the national honor of the state in medieval Europe. But when you get to the Enlightenment, all of a sudden it, it's up to the mob to tell the king what is the issue of the national honor. And you can you can see this in some roles, like like Federal Reserve Chairman, which is supposed to be the classic disinterested public servant, immune from the pressures of government, um, sort of like the Supreme Court. You can sort of see that this sort of pop, the sort of high-tech populism of American culture is now invading even those places, and that you need someone who 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 feels the pain of the average man in what is supposed to be a purely technocratic position. And I, I think that trend is going to continue. I want to agree with Jonah, unexpectedly, <laughs> on, on one point, and that is the profoundly transformative effect of the driverless car. I've actually thought a lot about that. And my prediction is that it will quickly enable teenagers to use the back seat for God's intended purpose, <laughs> even, when the car, even when the car's in motion. <laughs> uh, may I just take this opportunity to point out, because Tevi didn't, the single most astonishing fact in a book crammed with astonishing facts. And we've already, we've already heard the hook on which this fact depends. Uh, and that is Pablo Pical, uh, Casal's concert in the, the Kennedy White House. There was someone present at that concert who was also present at the first concert uh, that Casals gave in the White House in 1904. And that was Alice Roosevelt Longworth, Teddy's daughter. And, you know, talk about a sweep of history in one person. Mm -hmm. That fact blew me away, Teddy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's great. Thank you, Bill. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we at the Hudson Institute uh, hope that uh, what Jefferson read, Ike watched, and Obama tweeted will become an important part of American popular culture this fall. And uh, to further uh, that ambition, we have copies available for sale. And if you buy a copy today, you will have it signed and inscribed by the author. I'd like to thank all of you for being with us today. I'd like to thank uh, Jonah Goldberg, Bill Galston, and Mona Charon for their incisive comments. Most of all, I would like to thank and congratulate our author, Tevi Troy. We are adjourned. Thank you.